Good evening and welcome to The Right Side. I'm your host Chris Pereja and this evening we'll be talking about important news and issues from an admittedly conservative perspective. I'm joined this evening by Neil Mauman. He is an author of two books which we'll be discussing briefly and we'll also be talking about dissecting political arguments or how do you burn down straw men uh, as we go through the evening. Neil, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Chris. So first of all, as I'd mentioned, you're a, you're a writer, you're kind of the blogosphere's equivalent of a kickboxer, you're going out and <laughs> picking fights with people with opposing political Well, somebody's views. wrong on the internet all the time, and I've got to fix that, right? <laughs> you mean you can't believe everything you read? Well, uh, no, you know, half the quotes, that Abraham Lincoln said this, that half the quotes you see on the internet are wrong. Oh, well, that's <laughs> And I got that off the internet, too. <laughs> very interesting perspective. So, uh, how did, so when did you first discover you were an outspoken individual who had strong opinions that you wanted to voice in the public square? I think I was five. <laughs> but, so but you know, I mean, in a, in a sense, yes, obviously I grew up with that sort of a personality. Right. But I came here as an immigrant. And so when I came to the States uh, at the age of 18, and I saw that most Americans didn't really appreciate what they had, that's when I started speaking out. Okay. So, I mean, I can tell you more about it if you're interested. But. Well, we're interested. That's why you're here. <laughs> but so you weren't one of the quiet, soft-spoken immigrants that are so well-known. No, actually... no. I was always loud and aggressive. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. I mean I, I mean, I was soft-spoken in American po politics when I first came because I didn't understand it. Right. But once I started understanding, you know, that America, the America that I had come here for, I mean, the, the country I had wanted to come to was now changing to a country that to a type of country that I'd actually left, that we'd run away from, then I realized that uh, I needed to speak up. So. Excellent. And so in order to keep a controversial tone, you wrote a couple of books, both of which are very controversially, <laughs> very controversial from a subject matter perspective. Uh, one of them is about your, uh, one of your passions, I know, it's the apologetics ministry that you have uh, as part of your core of your right. being. It's who is Agent X. Tell us a little bit about the about the book and what that's about. Well, apologetics, as you know, is is the defense of Christianity, the proof of Christianity, and defending Christianity as a, uh, from a scientific, logical, rational, historical, philosophical, and archaeological basis. So, providing the proof that it's a real faith and not a blind faith. And I have a ministry called No Blind Faith. Uh, NoBlindFaith.com is a website. So, the book is called Who Is Agent X proving that science and logic show it's more rational to think God exists. So a subtitle would be proving God exists without using the Bible. Okay. So Excellent. and it basically goes through the Big Bang theory, goes through all these theories and it shows that the best evidence of the scientific data, that the data that's accepted by scientists, that is the Big Bang theory, is that there is a agent, a causal agent behind it, and that's what we call agent X. And so we're looking for that causal agent and that causal agent must have um, must be strong enough to create a uh, universe must be smart enough to fine tune the universe. Must be multi, uh, uh, multi, uh, mul you know, basically omnipresent in that universe. Must be personal and must have free will. Right. And those are the characteristics that we derive from actually the Big Bang theory. So you're saying intelligent design doesn't just happen on its own? Well, it wouldn't be very intelligent <laughs> if it did. did it? No. <laughs> yeah. In fact, we don't. I don't. I actually don't even talk about intelligent design in the book. But I refer to it. You know. I mean, I. In passing, I don't really go any, uh, spend any time on it. But yeah, I mean, obviously, um, I would be a fan of intelligent design. Yeah. Well, what's interesting is that I've heard all conservatives have no belief in science whatsoever, and you actually trying to prove the existence <laughs> of God and the, the basis for Christianity through science. You're well, talking crazy, well, man. It would be hard, hard for me not to be able to do that since I have uh, majors and minor degrees in, uh, in science, uh, you know, as a scientist, as an engineer. But I think if you really look back at the origin of science, the origin of science is people who thought that they wanted to understand how God had done things. And I would actually argue that if you think that, if you, if you pick up a watch and you say this watch is randomly put together, you will study the watch and understand the watch less than if you looked at the watch and said somebody with intelligence put the watch together. Right. Right? So it's easier to understand something if you say, well, I'm sure this has a purpose. And I think if we start looking at our diseases and we start looking at our our biology that way. I think we'd find a lot more uh, discoveries if we say, well, this must be here for a purpose, or there must be a reason why this is there. And I think we'll right. find a lot more right. discoveries scientifically that way. Excellent. And so the second book, no more controversial than that <laughs> one, is 
Jesus is involved in politics. And I've always been curious, is it Jesus was or Jesus is because the way that it's written? Well, yeah. So, so the, the title was originally, when I started working on it, it was called Jesus Was Involved in Politics. And the subtitle is, Why Aren't You? Why Isn't Your Church? Right. right. So it makes it more controversial. But as I f was working on the book, I realized that that doesn't make sense because Jesus is alive today. And if he was involved in politics before, why wouldn't he be involved in politics now? And then I argued, well, any time a bad law is passed that would grieve him, like, for instance, when slavery was, uh, or a good law was passed that would, that it would make him happy, um, obviously he would be involved in that. So when we, uh, when we banned slavery, do you think Jesus was involved in that attempt, even though, especially since it was tr done by Christians, obviously he was involved in that. So obviously he is involved, he was involved in politics back 2,000 years ago, and he is involved in politics on a daily basis. Yes, and I've actually read that book, and I have the other book and haven't read it yet, <laughs> but I have the t-shirt also, oh, I No Blind <laughs> Faith, which also gives people a reason to raise eyebrows and ask questions, even when you're not there. So, Well, the No Blind Faith t-shirt is great, because if you wear it to church, people think you're an atheist, uh, and, and then they'll, you'll get into conversations with them, and then if you work it, wear it to the mall, people think you're an atheist, and they'll get in conversations with you again, because they'll ask you what No Blind Faith is all about. Yeah, I actually was wearing mine at a Zachary's Pizza, and oh. I think it was somebody who was from the atheistic side who thought they had found a friend and <laughs> it, it can be good for entertainment value as well yeah that's true but so i read jesus is involved in politics and it actually reshaped the way that i argue it gave me more of a foundation for political discussion and you go into it in uh, you go into the art of arguing and helping people destroy their own arguments uh, it's kind of like I, I like Tai Chi politics or Tai Chi business, <laughs> using people's physical energy as Against they come to attack down. you to drive themselves into the ground. It's a beautiful thing to watch. <laughs> uh, but talk to us a little bit about how that Socratic method works. Well, there's, there's many ways to it, and, 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 and I have to admit that I didn't fine tune this. this is, I, I stole this idea uh, whole cloth from a gentleman named Greg Coco, who has an organization called Stand to Reason, and their website is str.org. And Greg talks about the Colombo tactic. And the Colombo tactic basically is a tactic where you never come out and attack somebody. You just ask questions. And you lead them in that Socratic method. For instance, so if somebody comes up and he says, well, you know, all you conservatives are mean-spirited and hate women, right? Yes. This is a whole attack by women. Now, if you say, no, we're not, when we like, you know, you, well, A, they're not going to believe you, and B, you're just going to come off as, as uh, a loudmouth, right? right? But on the other hand, if you just simply say, well, why do you think that? Right. You see, now you've not taken any burden of proof on yourself. Because if you say, no, they're not, now you've got to prove that they're not. Right. But if you say, why do you think that? Just, and this is if, if you're old enough to have watched Columbo. Columbo was this bumbling detective, and he would go and say, well, I'm kind of curious about this. And you would ask a question. So that's what you say. You just say, well, I'm kind of curious why you ask that, why you say that. Why, you know, why do you say that conservatives are mean-spirited? Now, notice, I've not said I'm a conservative. Right. So if they say, why are you a conservative? You'll say, well, that's not relevant, is it? I, I just want to know why you think conservatives right. are mean-spirited. Right. So I have not taken any monkeys on my back. And this actually even works in a college environment. Let's say you're sitting in class and your teacher says, you know, well, the Bible is a book full of myths and lies, right? Well, if you stand up for Jesus, quote, unquote, and say, no, it's not. Well, guess what? He's going to be on your case. All the other kids are going to be on your case. But you just raise your hand and say, well, professor, I'm kind of curious. Why do you say that? And let him answer. And, he, you know, and then there's a whole series of questions that you can do that we talk about in the book and we also talk about, um, and, and Santa Reason talks about. But if he says, well, it's because, you know, all the data in it is false. Mm -hmm. Well, then the next question you should say is, well, you've obviously, and you should add this, you say, well, it looks like you've done some research on it. Can you tell me what research you've done on it that shows that it's false? Now, you're assuming a couple of things. One, that the guy is intelligent enough to have done some research and is not merely regurgitating stuff he's heard from somewhere else. That and, never happens. And it never, happens, never happens, right? <laughs> and most of the time, it's just that they've heard someone else say that, you know? And, and it's just, it, you know, you, and you start walking down this path and you realize that they end up putting their own foot in their mouth most of the time. Sure. And, and then another beautiful thing about uh, this whole method is you run into something called suicide statements. And suicide statements are, it's, it's not a statement, it's not what you think it is, it's basically a statement that refutes itself. So if somebody says, for instance, um, I can't speak a word of English in English, that's a suicide statement. So because they've done three. <laughs> yeah, yeah you know, they've just said <laughs> that, right? Yeah. So they've, they've, the minute you said that in English, you've refuted it, right? So now, uh, a suicide statement that we don't always, often realize is this. If somebody says, well, there is no absolute truth. 
Well, your response is simply this. Well, I'm kind of curious. Can you, what, you know, um, are you sure about that? Is that true? Right. So if somebody says there's no absolute truth, you say, well, is that true? Now, what are they going to say? Um, because if they say it's true, guess what? They've just refuted themselves. Right. And the statement they just made is an absolute truth statement. So they've just refuted them. So suicide statements go on like that. For instance, uh, one that you'll hear in the political realm is, it's wrong for you to force your moral values on me. That's one of my favorites from your book. Yeah. So you just turn around and say, I'm sorry, is that your moral value? Right. In which case, why are you forcing that on me? Yes. And the reality is, you have to force moral values on other people. We force our moral values on criminals and thieves and prostitutes and whatever, right? The question is, whose moral values should you be imposing? And I would say, you know, is it mine, yours, Hitler's, or Mother Teresa's? Right. And I would say none of those. We should impose what the founding fathers said we should impose, and that's what the laws of nature and the laws of nature's God. Okay. And so... so uh, Let's do one through fruition. I mean, okay. uh, is so uh, one that we hear all the time is that for people who support traditional marriage, right, that they hate all gays. They, okay. So and this is so so if somebody says, well, you guys hate all gays, so well, why do you think that, yeah. right? Now the most question is, well, because you want to stop them from having their civil rights or their freedoms. So now you have a choice. If you know enough about the topic and you can start asking them, right. You could go to the next step, but if you don't, you can now step away from the argument because you've not made any claims. Right. Right. If you said, if you said, well, you know, I'm, it's beyond my ability to go further. I've not taken any. I've just revealed something about the person. So if they say, well, because you want to remit the civil, civil rights, my question is, so let me ask you this: What is a civil right? What is a right? You know, is the right to get married to somebody of the same sex a right? And what, are, what should we make our laws for? Now, it turns out that what gays are asking for, what they're arguing for, is they want the right to marry someone of the same sex because they want to continue having, living the gay lifestyle. Well, the reality is most gays don't want to get married. Not only do they don't want to get married, the gays who do get married never stay married, and they're almost never celibate. In fact, they, there's studies that can show, we can show that prove that something 90 to 95 percent of all gays are never celibate throughout their lives. Now, this doesn't mean that heterosexuals are celibate. Many heterosexuals well, are not, not celibate, celibate too. Yeah. But we disapprove that lifestyle too, right? right? We think that's bad too. So the second part of that, though, is it turns out that the homosexual lifestyle is actually very damaging to the body. And there's statistics, even from the Center for Disease Control, that show that the average homosexual uh, man will die 18 to 20 years earlier than the average heterosexual man. And most of the, and that's not just AIDS. That's a whole host of these fetal oral diseases, um, a bunch of uh, stomach diseases, a bunch of just all these diseases, including uh, addictions and things like that, violence. And it's it's very tragic. And so the question we have to ask is: Is this something that we want the state to endorse? Do we want the state to endorse something that leads to early death? Do we want the state? To, I mean, come on, we're suing we're suing tobacco companies for reducing lifespans by six years. And here's a thing that reduces lifespans by 18 years. Do we really want the state to fund it? Do we want to ban it? No. If they want, you know, I believe in freedom. Let them, let them if they want to do those things, they can do it. Mm -hmm. But I don't want the state to be giving them tax deductions and giving, you know, things like that. And then there's a third argument. It just came out today, in fact, uh, June 12, 2012, showed that same-sex couple, kids who come from same-sex couples, are far worse off than kids. I'm not just a little worse off. But far, they did a study, this is one of the biggest studies they've done, over a thousand couples. They found out that kids who grew up in same-sex uh, households are 42% more likely to have been sexually abused, 33% more likely to have had been forced to have unwilling sex, and they're 38% more likely to be on uh, welfare. And it just the list goes right down the line there. It's actually worse for a kid to be brought up in a same-sex family. I, I haven't heard that. It's a brand new, just came out today. Okay. And I can, and if you, uh, we'll, we'll put a link on it. It's actually on my Facebook page. page. So if you go to Jesus is Involved in Politics, look on Facebook, Jesus is Involved in Politics, you'll see the link and you'll see all the data right there. And so, I mean, what are, the, what are some of the main arguments that you hear in opposition uh, to your political stances? <coughs> Obviously, your, your faith is important yep. to you and you're, you're holding a more traditional view. What are the arguments that you come across most often? Well, most of the things is that we're closed-minded, right? Mm -hmm. And I think the difference is what, what, what I try to do is I try to explain that it's not that I'm closed-minded, that I'm looking for practical, real solutions. See, we believe that there is an objective morality, and that objective morality is related to a physical reality. 
So just like you have the law of gravity, there's a law of morals or a law of love or law, of, you know, whatever. These are laws that God has created. Right. And if you go back uh, 2,000 years to Cicero, before Christ even, Cicero realized that if there was a natural law, if you obeyed the natural law, you would be prosperous and have less disease. If you disobeyed the natural law, you would get sick. So Cicero thought that if I just watched what made people sick and what caused disease and what caused death and what caused illness and what caused psychological problems, mm -hmm. then I could figure out what this natural law was. Right. And the founding fathers actually thought, called this the laws of nature and the laws of nature is God. Okay. Right? So we, we, can, we believe in those things, laws of nature and nature is God. Now we believe there are three sources of the law, as I say in the book. There's the revealed law, which is what we said God gave to us in this Bible. Mm -hmm. We believe there's the conscience law. That's the law that we know inside us. You know, we know it's wrong to hit somebody. We know it's wrong to kill somebody. And then the final one is the revealed law. And the revealed, sorry, is the discovered law. And the discovered law is the law that we learned through the school of hard knocks. Mm -hmm. And what we're trying to tell people is, look, if you disobey the revealed law, you'll run headlong into the discovered law, and it will be a very painful process. You know, while growing up, I would always say, Lord, give me wisdom by watching other people's pain, not my own. <laughs> right? <laughs> you prefer to watch them bump their head on the rock right. as opposed yeah, to it's like, you know, it's like I want to watch somebody else stick their head, light, hand in this light socket and get a shock and say, oh, I ain't, ain't going to do that. I don't right. want to do that because right. I've seen them do it. Right. So in the same way, um, societies do that. They do certain things and they get pain and suffering, and they realize they shouldn't do it. And it's sometimes passed to us as traditions. Mm -hmm. Well, marriage is one of those traditions. And not only is it the tradition passed to societies without the revealed law, but it's also the tradition passed as the revealed law in the Bible. And so you see those things, two, two things emerging, and you see that over and over and again in societies. And so what we should do, what I tell people is, let's look at the statistics, let's look at the studies, let's look at the, the evidence without emotions. Mm -hmm. Because the minute you bring emotions in, you've got a preconceived decision. You, I, you know, now we all have emotions, but we want to be as emotionless when we look at data and let the data speak for itself. Right, and so what happens uh, when, when someone is totally coming after you with an extremely emotional argument? They have no facts uh, necessarily whatsoever. They, they're, they are regurgitating their talking points, right. what have you. Is there ever a time where you don't go into the blogosphere at kickboxing and you just... <laughs> yeah. So a lot of times I will not engage if I can see that they're purely emotional argument. Mm -hmm. My job then is not to engage but to actually be the kind and gentle person in the sense. So I will actually befriend people um, and, and, and then engage with them on a different level. Because I know... Because one thing is you can't... The question I have to always ask myself is I, do I want to win the argument or do I want to win the person? Mm -hmm. And sometimes I want to win the argument because I don't care about the person. I care about everybody else. I mean, seriously, you know? It depends on the mood. Yeah. Well, no, it also depends on who else is watching. So if I'm dealing with an atheist one-on-one, -on -one, I care about the atheist. But if I'm doing a debate with an atheist and there are 50 people or 1,000 people watching and they are influenced by him, then I care about them. So I may want to win the argument gently and not worry about the atheist because I know he's unreachable. But there are other times when I'll, you know, if I'm talking to a friend of mine, I have lots of friends who are atheists. In fact, this book was edited by um, an atheist. He's a, he sits in the cube next to me. Uh, we totally disagree on this issue, but he's a good friend, and I care about him. And in his case, I'm not interested in beating him over the head with it. I'm just saying, here's the information. Let's talk about it. And he actually helped me edit it, which is great. because you know that's. And so I think that there are times when you want to, when you see the emotional content there and you want to back off from it. Yeah. Hopefully, you recognize that before you're in the middle of it. If you're in the middle of it, then, then that's a tough one. You, um, my guess is you're not going to win the argument. If you, the, Greg Kokel, again, French Reason, says, if, if you get mad, you lose. If they get mad, you lose. Right. So you want to try and, uh, you know, so you've got the balancing act in many cases. Right. But what's interesting about what you say, and I believe this wholeheartedly, is that even if as humans we disagree about one topic or another, on other things we will agree, right. and it doesn't necessarily mean that just because we may be politically or religiously and a complete misalignment, right. that we can't treat each other and argue with love exactly. and respect. Exactly. And, and actually, sometimes you can bring people over to your way of thinking. Well, yeah, and, and sometimes because you were not such an impediment, their minds are open, and somebody else may lead them. In fact, in the book, opening of the book, I talk about a, a gentleman that I met at a uh, healthcare rally. Right? He was on the union side. You know, they wanted Obamacare, and we were on the Tea Party side, right? And he said, oh, y'all, there's no... And I was wearing a Reagan shirt, and he said, there's no way you'll ever... We'd ever agree, right? 
well, we're big friends now. We go to lunch all the time. Right. And he actually is against healthcare now. It had nothing to do with me, but now we're friends. And because at that moment I said, well, can't we just talk? Can't we just discuss as gentlemen, as respectful people um, about these concepts right. and see where it leads, you know? And, and he, he appreciated that. So we're, we're actually friends. Well, great. Thank you for sharing. And how can people find out more information? So about they can you? go to uh, JesusIsInvolvedInPolitics.com or J3IP.com. Or if they're interested in the apologetics, which is the defense of Christianity, they can go to NoBlindFaith.com. So J3IP.com or NoBlindFaith.com. Thanks, Neil. Thank you very much, Chris. And at this point, we'll go ahead and take a quick break for a word from our underwriter, the Conservative Forum. constitutional law attorney. And they say, well, really, what kind of constitutional law attorney? I say, well, I'm the kind of the true kind, the kind of believe that the Constitution is what the Constitution says and what it was intended to say. Anything beyond that is tyranny and should not be allowed. Um, so. so it's come to this, my friends. You're ready to second American Revolution against a ruling class that simply lectures but does not listen or defend the American people. It is government versus the people. Am I right? Yeah. Look at the Electoral College example. Right? A leftist popular challenge to states' rights. You think the founders were brilliant people? Did they not know what they were doing? By carefully calibrating to get the small states and the big states to come together? Why does Wyoming get two senators in California? Actually, I'd rather have Wyoming's two senators. <laughs> We'd like to thank our, our underwriters, the Conservative Forum. You can learn more about them at theconservativeforum.com. But additionally, just so you know, they do have speaking, uh, they have speaker series, and normally they happen on the first Tuesday of each month. In July, it is the second uh, Tuesday of the month because of the 4th of July holiday. And on that night, they'll be hosting Tom Tancredo, who we also hope to have on the show before he heads over there. On August, the first Tuesday of the month, we have Jack Cashel. In September, it's John Fund. And in October, it's Jesse Lee Peterson. The Conservative Forum meets at 432 Stirling Road in Mountain View. And again, you can learn more at theconservativeforum.com. At this point in the show, we usually spend a couple of minutes together with a more commentary and our kiss goodbye. But I wanted to talk to you a little bit about some of the things that are happening in New York currently or in San Francisco and how some of our freedoms are being lost by illogical arguments. There's a scenario that's been coming along in the last couple of weeks where Mayor Bloomberg is outlawing restaurants from serving drinks, sodas, and sugary drinks, Starbucks, anything over 16 ounce size because it will make people fat. Or in San Francisco, we have a scenario where they're trying to outlaw Happy Meals being sold at McDonald's because Happy Meal toys make children fat. 
My argument would be that if the children aren't eating the toys, the toys themselves aren't making them fat. It's more of a parenting issue or another issue, and that is we're trying to solve symptoms instead of looking at the root cause of the problem. Number one, personal responsibility is a root cause, but also if you look at the fact that these types of things are less expensive than buying something of quality due to increasing fuel prices or other issues that are driving up the costs of various foodstuffs and, and beverages, et cetera, it's actually less expensive for someone to go to a fast food restaurant and feed a family. I know I can feed a family of five on about $14 at a fast food restaurant where it costs more than that to make a couple of simple sandwiches at home. We need to look at the issues. We need to look at parenting styles. We need to look at people being able to say no or make intelligent, educated decisions as opposed to taking everyone's liberties away from them uh, without reasonable, uh, w without a reason to, to do so. On that note, I'd like to thank you for joining us on the right side this evening. Again, I'm Chris Pareja, and we look forward to seeing you again in the near future. Have a great night.